Let's focus for a minute on how to prepare and how to deliver a good closing argument. Now, when you think about closing arguments, you have to realize that your instincts are to do very much what it is that you did in opening statement. And having seen literally thousands of opening statements by young lawyers over the years, let me tell you that one of the most difficult things is to break your already habits about thinking about opening statement when you think about closing arguments. And so let me talk to you about how really opening statements are different from closing arguments. And I think the best image that I can give you is to give you the image of that closing arguments are like jazz. That the analogy for you, and you're thinking about and preparing for closing arguments, you should think about what is it about jazz that makes jazz interesting and gives it its special structure. And that will help you in thinking about what you're doing with closing argument. Well, first, when you think about jazz, you know that that opening grabbing theme is very, very important, but that you also know that as the person is getting going, that there is a tone that the musician is bringing to it that is appropriate. And so I want to talk to you about how you set the right tone to be heard, to have the people enjoy what you have to say and be persuaded by it. Number two, when you're thinking about jazz, you know that that grabber, that theme, gets played out the first time in good jazz and it lays out the simple structure from which the variations are going to follow. And so having a clear and, and understandable focus and structure to your very beginning is crucial for how you start your closing argument. In addition, the variation and the interest that comes from the plays off of that theme are what make jazz its particular interest. And so the structure of your presentation has got to be thought of in terms of its variations, in terms of what it is that you're trying to lead and what message you're trying to give. And therefore the structure is inherently important when you're thinking about being persuasive in closing. And finally, it's important to have a big finish. It's important to have the layout of what it is that you're doing so that you end on an upbeat so that the folks can leave you humming your tune and singing your song. Now I want to go back and use this as a structure for describing then some tips for you about how to prepare and deliver a good closing argument. First then, remember that there is an expectation at closing that there is an opportunity to be more dramatic. Now, in particular then, what folks think about doing is, is they think about having a theme statement that they lead with as opposed to doing what is so often boilerplate in any kind of lawyer speaking, which is this kind of throat clearing or warm up, where what you do is you thank the jury for all the time that they've spent here and that you are sure that they are tired and that it's been a complex case and but what, what you want to do is now to sum up for them and to show them what it is that you've shown in this case. But that boilerplate, that beginning boilerplate, unfortunately, it doesn't start with a clear understanding of what your case is about. And since primacy and recency tell us that people remember very best what they hear first, you have a particular strong moment to persuade at the beginning of your closing. And so, as you think about the beginning of your closing argument, what you want to do is you want to think about what your bumper sticker is or what your theme statement is that you can lay across the front of your closing argument and not be afraid to deliver it directly, clearly, so that everybody can identify it and that it's done in a tone that's not afraid of slowing it down and repeating it. Now, you know, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the notion that in the O.J. Simpson case, you might start with, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Members of the jury, if it does not fit, if the glove doesn't fit, then you must acquit. That you lay out, then, your bumper sticker for the case at the beginning. This is true in commercial cases also. It could be, for example, that you stand up in BMI versus Minicom and say, members of the jury, if you don't play by the rules, then you're going to lose. The game needs to be played by the rules. And Minicom took it upon itself to play the game of purchasing computer parts and decided that the rules weren't for them 
They could play by their own rules. And members of the jury will show you that this case then, and will argue to you that this case, amounts to that simple proposition that Minicom did not play by the rules and therefore must forfeit the game and pay the price. So that you take your case and you give it its bumper sticker start. You give it its label over the top of it and you deliver it and there is an appropriate level of drama with which you should use as you start. Now remember that as opposed to an opening statement where what you're doing is very quickly going to a format that is a, st a storytelling format, when you're talking about tone now and structure, you're talking about being able to argue the inferences. Now is the time to argue the inferences. That does not mean you become shrill. It does not mean that you become loud for loudness sake. But what you do is you do allow yourself to go ahead and get to that level where you're doing more than just storytelling, but you're in fact saying what the case means and what you can infer from what the evidence has said. Now, in doing that then, remember that what you want to do is to have good eye contact with the jury. You want to look them directly in the eye. You want to talk to them, very much like you did an opening statement. But that, in fact, there is an expectation that there's going to be more going on. There's more distance, usually, that the lawyer takes at the beginning to allow for a more of a projection as they're talking in a more dramatic tone. And the idea is that at closing argument, the jurors are expecting some more storytelling, some more analogies, and so the lawyer can let it go more, let it out more, and describe with the emotion that is consistent and genuine with what it is that they have to say, that in fact now, in closing argument, is the time to do that. Now, what your structure then is going to be as you're setting this tone is to allow the facts to lead to your ability to argue the inferences. And so as you set your right tones, you want to give a preview to your audience about what it is that you expect to do. And I want to say a little bit more about that. But don't be afraid after your opening bumper sticker, as you describe the beginning of the closing argument, to then say, now what we'd like to do is to go back through the evidence and structure the evidence according to a number of clear issues to help you understand why it is that you should win this case. And so you want to take the facts and then you want to say what inferences can be derived from those facts. The law piece of closing arguments is now very appropriate for you to weave in to your argument. And the tone that you set should unapologetically tell them what the jury will be instructed. And please do not forget this, that the tone also is such that you want to be clear about the verdict form and what boxes for folks to check. You are a teacher in this regard. You're not a lecturer, you're not worried that they won't be able to get it, but your, your purpose is to teach them what the law is and how that law will apply to the facts in the case. And these are all then tone issues you should, you should be concerned about. Now let's talk about the analytical structure some more to think about what it is that you're doing when you're trying to get the jury to see the persuasive nature of it. And in a way here what we're talking about is what's at the essence of any good argument. What you want to do is remember, we talked about this before, is to match the jury instructions with your facts in the case and have a clear idea of how those jury instructions are going to make a difference in this case. So you should be aware of some classic kinds of jury instructions and understand what it is that they say in order to be able to have the jury see how they work in a particular case. So for example, if the jury instructions on proximate cause are important to the case and you're a plaintiff's attorney and you need to describe why it is that direct cause or proximate cause does not need to be the last cause in the case. It needs to be a cause that is a but-for cause that leads naturally and probably to the result that's reached. And so what you need to do is then in your closing argument is to match the jury instruction on what is proximate cause, that it is the, pro the cause that naturally and probably uh, leads to the, to the consequence that you're alleging in the case, and that that is the definition that you want them to be aware of when they're thinking about 
what it is that happened in a given case. Or that, for example, if the parties have reached the equivalent of a jury instruction, for example, in BMI versus Minicom, if what they've done is they have reached a stipulation between the parties that, in fact, requires that in order for insurance to be purchased and the risk of loss not to pass at the point of shipment, that a specific request needs to be made. Here's the place, then, for you to go ahead and lay out what the rule is that's going to govern the behavior of the parties. The verdict form is crucial to this process also, to look at what boxes folks need to check and to be aware that, in fact, for us, it may be second nature what the meaning of some of these boxes are and the terms are, but it's important for you to decide what it is that you need to show them, where to circle, and what to check off. Now, when you're thinking about the overall structure of the case, in closing argument, what you're asking yourself is, if I was a juror in this case, what questions would I have? And what, then, answers do I need to have them see and provide them in order to be able to reach the verdict? Organize yourself that way. Think of, put yourself in the juror's shoes. What questions will the jurors have? And then how can you use that to structure the closing argument and give them the answers? And so, if you decide for yourself that you want to say, well, you know, the issue is in this case, as in BMI versus Minicom, the issue is whether or not it is fair to have Minicom pay for goods that they never received. And in addition, as to whether or not, in fact, we've shown you that BMI was sending the wrong parts, not paying attention to messages that they were given directly, not once, but on two different occasions, and therefore the, whether they should be accountable for the loss of those, those, pri those uh, parts because of what it is that they failed to do. And say these are the issues and then let's see whether or not now we've shown you that in fact BMI did send the wrong parts and they were not paying attention to what they were told and that they had an opportunity to fix the problem with a simple phone call and that their failure to pay attention and do business as what is required of them and what they promised to do is what's caused the problem in this case. Let's look back and see whether we've shown that those things took place. And so what you're doing then is you're taking in the closing argument these issues that appeal to the fairness, the underlying fairness of the parties, and you're matching them to promises that you've made in your opening statement. And of course we'll say more about those promises when we talk to you about opening statements. Now, as you're going through the process and you're talking about the analytical structure that you're going to use, that as you lay out the key issues then for the jury about what it is that they're going to need to do, don't be afraid in closing argument to recreate those moments in the trial where you believe you produced the particular result that should drive their decision. If there was a key part of your cross-examination that you get it, got an admission from Elliot Milstein about what it is that he was doing when he was relying on a fellow like Michael Lubell. And you've got to admit that he had concerns about whether or not he was really the right person for the job. Well, now is the time to recreate that cross-examination, recreate that moment to remind the jury of what was admitted to, and to do that then within the analytical structure of what that shows, whether that shows that, for example, Minicom was not only inexperienced, but frankly, they had folks that were incompetent at what it is that they were doing. So you line up then the facts with these, these uh, issues that you've laid out and the jury instructions which will drive the decision. This is the place also to tell what the documents mean. This is the place not only to call out the telephone log of Michael Lubell and to show the telephone log and remind them that it says that they will insure. But tell them what that means, that in fact it corroborates that in fact Michael Lubell did ask Ms. Young on early part of January 2006 to make sure that they would insure these parts. And therefore it's fair for him when he refers to that in his conversation with the secretary, he asked that this be done, that in fact that's a fair notice to them that they are to insure those products. So tell the jury what the documents mean to help them understand what it is that you've shown during the trial. 
Now let me just say a quick word about the hierarchy of persuasion and some of this, uh, this information really is important for you to understand in criminal law context, but I think it's applicable also in civil law context. When you're thinking about your hierarchy of persuasion, you want to realize that whatever physical evidence that you've got, that that's going to be superior in the jurors' minds. That's the number one piece of evidence that the jurors are going to be looking at. And so if what you have is you've got blood stains and the blood type matches, you've got physical evidence that the defendant is there. If what you have is you have a glove that doesn't fit, you've got physical evidence that the jury is going to really put a lot of weight on. If you've got a telephone log that in fact shows that they will insure at our cost, that in fact if that reliability of that is unchallenged and that there's no um, uh, messing around with that physical evidence that would suggest that in fact it did not uh, come and was not created at the time it was created, well then the physical evidence has the highest level of persuasiveness in your cases. Then eyewitness testimony is the next, what it is that people who have an objective point of view overheard and saw, that testimony is going to be very important. When you think about that in your closing arguments, compare the credibility of your witnesses and remind the jury of the jury instruction that says that's for them to do, that's their job, is to decide who's lying and who's telling the truth. And so as you lay out these factors of bias and your factors of credibility, as you come to the point where you ask the members of the jury, can you rely on this person's testimony? Is it reliable? Then what you're doing is you're lining up the eyewitness's testimony and you're comparing it in a kind of a dueling banjos way to determine which one is more credible. Is Roger Clemens lying or is his trainer lying? When you look at that question, you're looking at and examining and analyzing their perspectives, their biases, who's got more to lose, who's got more at stake, whether the person's lied before in other contexts, and you're judging then between those two parties. And the, mem the, the job of the trial lawyer in closing is to do that comparison and help the jury see the strengths of your witness's point of view. Remember, the juries are going to be instructed about circumstantial evidence. The jury instruction says the following. It says, the law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. Each of it, says the law, can have equal probability and power to it. And so, you know, we can never see into somebody's mind as to what it is that they heard or what it is that they said or what it is that they actually saw. But what we can do is we can look at the circumstantial evidence. And the jury instruction tells the jurors that, that they can take that circumstantial evidence and the direct evidence and put it together and weigh it to determine what it is that they believe. But having said that, and even though the law says that, recognize that in fact the jurors put more credence on the eyewitness testimony than they do on the circumstantial evidence. And that's part of the hierarchy of persuasion that you need to be aware of. So these then become a set of multiple reasons for why you've proven a particular case. To the extent that you have physical evidence, you want to lead with that. Then if you can back it up with what somebody saw or heard or come, came into the courtroom and said, that's terrific. And frankly, if you've got then backup circumstantial evidence from what other people said or did or knew, then obviously this is a hierarchy that builds one on the other to a point where the jury can be taken over the top and believe what you say. Now, analogies and common sense are also very key terms for, or, or techniques for you to be able to be aware of. And let me just say to you that analogies are something that because of the drama and the setting of closing argument, this is the time to take these analogies out. Now let me suggest to you that there are some real risks with analogies. That in fact, analogies might be able to be turned by your opponent. It's why very often a good analogy by a plaintiff's attorney is safe for a bottle uh, to a point where it can't be turned. But if you have a, an analogy that you believe does capture the emotion or the heart of what it is that's going on, this is the place to think about doing it. And match that analogy with your common sense and the juror's common sense can allow the jury to see you as a human being and to see you and to identify with you as really the credible party in the courtroom. And let me just tell you one of my favorites and give you a couple of examples in order to, to, to make the point. Imagine with me 
that you have to stand up and you have to represent a very famous doctor. We'll call him Dr. Madden. And Dr. Madden is one of the most world-renowned surgeons, heart transplant surgeons in the world. Imagine that your closing argument is going to have to deal with some very troubling facts. That what happened is, is that just before an operation on a Mr. Nathan Farrell, uh, an operation that went badly very quickly after you got done, and where there is an appearance that in fact a knot may have been not tied or a suture may have been nicked, that in fact that night before that operation you s spent the night on the couch of your first surgical assistant, a woman named Phyllis Trucks. So if you're standing up as a lawyer and you're Dr. Madden's attorney and you know that you have to deal with that, you have a real burden to overcome as the jurors are expecting that a person that doesn't get much sleep is kicked out of the house by his wife of 17 years and now is in uh, spending some time with this woman who is, seems to be an assistant of his. What is his mental state going to be and would that affect how he performed his task? Well, if you're Jim Jeans, a famous trial lawyer from uh, Missouri, and you had that task, here's what you might do. You might stand up in front of the jury and tell the following story. You might remind the members of the jury of what was like in 1926 when the New York Yankees played the St. Louis Cardinals. And how that whole year the Cardinals had been led by one of their famous most um, uh, renowned pitchers, a great big tall left-hander named Grover Cleveland Alexander. And he brought him into the World Series and he led the way by winning one of the first games and in the rotation in the sixth game of the World Series he pitched again and he pitched magnificently and so what we had is we had the Cardinals in a position to be able to win the World Series if they won the seventh game of the World Series. So. What happens? Well, the night before, what we understand is, is that Grover Cleveland Alexander went out and partied. He had a wonderful time. And um, the word is, is that he came in the next day and he was quite hungover. Come seventh inning of the seventh game of the World Series, what you had is you had Missouri coming up to the, to the plate and the Cardinals were protecting a one-run lead, but the pitcher was faltering. And so the manager looked down in the seventh inning and saw Alexander and he said, all right, big guy, you brought us here. I want you to take us home. So in surprise setting, here comes Alexander into play and he's given the ball and he shakes out the cobwebs and he leans back and he fires first a ball. But then he fires a strike and he struck out Lazuri and he struck out the side in the seventh and he struck out the side in the eighth and he struck out the first two batters in the ninth and had a ground out for the last out and the Cardinals won the World Series. And then Jim Jeans paused and looked at the members of the jury and said, you see, it was not his condition, it was his performance that counted. And let me tell you about Dr. Madden and the type of person that Dr. Madden is. He's done hundreds of transplant surgeries and when the game is on the line, he performs. So this stuff about his condition is a distraction. And let's go and show you that the evidence shows that it was his performance that counted and there was not one bit of evidence in that operating room that he did anything but perform magnificently. So you can see that the power of the analogy is to get the jury to line up with the perspective that you want to have the jury line up by way of storytelling. Recognize also that what Jim Jeans did is he followed the simple rules of telling analogies. First of all, he said, is this a story that I can tell authentically? Recognize for Paul's weird to stand up and tell this story has got a problem associated with it. I'm too young to have been aware of the 1927 New York Yankees. But Jim Jeans can describe this authentically because when he grew up he heard about this and so it resonates truthfully into his environment and the jurors are not distracted about how it is that Jim Jeans could possibly know all about this stuff. Number two, what he's done is he thought about it carefully and he's asked, can it be turned? 
can it be can it be flipped and of course with every analogy there is that risk because it is an analogy we're not talking about baseball we're talking about something much more serious but if the analogy is something that captures an emotion and an experience of folks in a way that in fact helps them understand the case and it can be told and told authentically it can have enormous power in the courtroom now let me tell you though that this danger of turning is real and let me just describe to you what it is that David Malone, another great trial lawyer, did after Jim Jeans got done. And also talk to you about another technique that can be very, very powerful for you in closing argument. Malone stands up after Jim Jeans is done and he is for the plaintiff. And what he does is he simply tells the following. He says, members of the jury, when Mrs. Nathan Farrell went back to the hospital room on that evening after she had made one of the most difficult decisions of her whole life, when she had decided that on the advice of the doctors that there was nothing more that could be done for her husband and that he was brain dead and had to make the decision to unplug the machine. She went back to that hospital room and she picked up her clothes and she picked up her sweater and she picked up the things that she had brought into that hospital room the last two weeks while Nathan was waiting for the operation. And she gathered those things and she gathered her keys and her purse and she walked out of that room for the last time. And she pushed the button to go down to the downstairs, past the nurse's station and out the front door. And she walked out to her car and she she fumbled her keys, she tried to put them into the lock. And members of the jury, we were asking her, asking you to compensate her for having to make that drive home alone. Members of the jury, you see that baseball game analogy, in fact, fails. Because if you were in that audience and in that stadium that day, and if instead when you looked away and looked back that the batter was not striked out but had been hit in the head and laid across the plate, well, what would you know about his condition, about Grover Cleveland's condition, is that his condition, in fact, caused something bad to happen. And in this case, there was no striking out batter. What there was was there was a death and that death was Nathan Farrell's. His condition relates. The analogy fails. And so he goes on and he does his rebuttal in closing argument by not only grabbing the heart of the emotion about what it is that's happened in the case by a simple storytelling device of walking in the shoes of Mrs. Nathan Farrell in a moment of tremendous distress but he then also flips the analogy by showing that there's something that's different about it and that is obviously in the, res in the result that's been reached. So analogies are powerful. They can grasp the jury's attention and they can make the jury argue about what it is that you want them to argue about. But please also recognize that there are some real risks to them. My suggestion to you is that the more powerful the analogy the more you can highlight it up front. And the more you're concerned about the analogy, the more you should consider whether to make it into a simple metaphor, whether or not to not lead with it, but to put it in as one of the arguments as opposed to the whole marking of the whole argument that you're making. So for example, if you're dying to tell the story of what your grandfather used to say when you were a kid, something like, you know, my grandfather used to tell me that just because you spend seven hours in the garage doesn't make you a car, no matter than spending a lot of time in church makes you a good person. And you want to tell that analogy, well, if, you've, if the problem is, is that the other side has been putting a lot into the character of another individual, what it is that they've done in the past and therefore they must be a good person in the future, that analogy will have some play. But as opposed to making it the head note of the whole case and spending time at the beginning, it's something that you can add in as an additional reason for why it is that the jury ought to decide the case your way. Now let's talk about then the structure of these arguments and how to put some of these points together into an overall argument. I want to talk to you about the importance that if you're going to go on for a period of time, 
I hope just as I've done for you here is that a preview of what that structure is will give you more of an attention span that if you just seem to be going from one point to the next and there doesn't seem to be a structure to it. So to the extent that what you might do is like what you would do before appellate court, which is to break out the issues for them. Similarly, break out the issues for the jury about how it is that you're going to handle your closing argument and review it. So you want to talk about, in BMI versus Minicom, what is the common practice in the industry, if you're BMI, about how risk of loss passes, and what you've proven about whether the risk of loss passes at the point that it's given to the shipper. And then you want to talk to them about whether or not there was a specific request and show them what it is that's in D20 about the language that was used and show them that the fact that insurance was not used. And then talk about the claims that the Minicom is making with regard to damages and why it is fair for Minicom to be responsible for the actions that they've taken. So you lay out then a structure about what it is that you want to talk about and that gives them the jury when you move from one point to the next a new starting point to think about when you bring them into the case. And so preview your analytical structure. The analytical structure can be by the elements of the case. It can be by the chronology of the transaction. Pick a structure that will be most beneficial to you and that's part of the art and then preview it for the members of the jury. How perhaps the structure you're picking is neither of those, neither chronological or topical but is by matter of proof. I want to talk to you about the direct physical evidence in the case. I want to talk to you about the eyewitness testimony and talk to you about the circumstantial evidence that corroborates what happened in the case. So your structure then will help the jury stay with you as you move from point to point. Also, be careful, especially if you are a defense lawyer, that you concede the human emotion that's in the case. To argue vociferously that your client did not do the crime without conceding that a crime had been committed by somebody or that there was a victim in this case is likely to be a mistake. And for especially for a big corporation like BMI to not have any kind of recognition of the injury and the damage that can be done by a lost shipment is to not recognize a human emotion that may be in the case. Now you don't need to go overboard. It's not a tragedy for a company like Minicom to lose uh, parts like this because obviously it was their responsibility according to BMI to make sure that they're covered and insured. There's always risks of doing business. Businesses fail every day and that uh, human emotion doesn't need to be in a kind of a saccharine way overstated and overdone. But what you do want to do is to say to yourself, would the members of the jury have a problem just simply on an emotional level and to concede that emotional level with the following then statement, but it's not fair to blame that fact, the victim of the crime, on somebody who is innocent or somebody who did not cause it. And so concede the human emotion and link it to a clear understanding of the fairness issues that are involved in the case. Then let me suggest you two different mnemonics that can help you in thinking about how you want to take each one of these individual issues and organize your presentation on that issue. As you'll see in the materials that are in the library, what you can do is you can organize it according to what I call crack, conclusion, rule, analysis, con and conclusion. This is a structure, C-R-A-C, which is the one that you hear most often from prosecutors. Members of the jury, the defendant is guilty. The law says that you're guilty of a crime when you do these terrible things. We showed that you did these terrible things, therefore he is guilty of the crime as charged. And we ask you for a verdict in our favor. The structure of it is conclusion, rule, analysis, and conclusion. But you can see with my finger pointing and my voice, it's very hard not to deliver that structure with also a little bit of a, an authoritative tone to it. And the more that the jury may be resisting the authoritative nature of your presentation, the more that they're struggling with the elements of the crime or with the facts and the proof, it may be hard for them to hear through that authoritarian structure, especially 
because American jurors today are really anti-authoritarian. They're anti-intellectual. They would rather just to appeal to common sense. And so I would suggest to you that you also be aware of another structure, a structure that starts more with a genuine issue that you have in the case and then attempts to stack the facts, the fact, fact, facts, that support then the resolution of that issue out of fairness. And so I think of IFRAC as issue, fact, fact, sometimes analogy, rule, sometimes an analysis like you've done before where you're matching the facts with the rule of law, and then what you do is you end with a question which is much more open-ended. So members of the jury, is it fair to say? As an example of that IFRAC structure, and think about how that might work out where you're asking, is it fair really for Jenny Young to have picked up from that telephone conversation that insurance was needed in this case? And to be able to ask the jurors that directly and walk right up to it and not be afraid of it. And to be able to then say, well, members of the jury, is that fair? Is it fair for BMI and Chris Kay to have structured their business such that Ginny Young would be put in that position is another way of reframing the issue and stacking the facts that show that she answers the phone and says, Mr. Kay's office, Ginny Young speaking, that in fact she doesn't deny that that phone call was made, that his statement to her, please ensure, of a $500,000 amount of an order, which is obviously a huge order, is something that draws, she's drawn attention to and that prompted a telephone call from her to Chris Kay to tell him about that fact, that there was a $500,000 order. And that in fact he then takes the responsibility to ensure whether or not the customer's needs are met in that case. And he never directed her to check the file. And he never directed her to call Minicom and ask about the question of insurance. And was that fair for him to do? Obviously it is, because he knows that they have no insurance. We knew that from Hilton Head. And we also know that he, in fact, was aware of it when he talked to Elliot Milstein at the time in the Hilton Head uh, con convention, that the, the golf exposition. So my, my point is, is that you then stack the facts that help the jury to see the fairness of what it is that you're arguing and remind them that if in fact he had chosen to be away at a time such a large order comes in because he's climbing the corporate ladder, then he has to make sure that he instructs his secretary clearly to look at the earlier transaction in September and to read the account statement and for her not to ignore what was in that account statement and to just simply on her own decide that insurance did not need to be uh, ordered in this case. And so what you have is you have an IFRAC approach that's structured from the issue to the facts to the analysis to the rule and whether or not a specific request has been, been asked for is what's at the heart of it. And finally, you can end then by simply saying, some members of the jury, was it in fact any BMI's responsibility to ensure the parts and let the jury reach the conclusion for themselves. Now, as you're thinking about your closing arguments, Please remember that part of what you need to do is to anticipate the response that's going to come from the other side. Uh, if you're the defense closer, to anticipate that the plaintiff is still going to have some rebuttal, at least in many jurisdictions where the plaintiff gets the last word. And so what you want to do is to anticipate that rebuttal by anticipating what they're going to have to say and then going ahead and shooting it down. You can do the anticipation within each one of your three or four or five issues that you've laid out for the members of the jury, or you can save up your anticipation for the, uh, of the rebuttal for a kind of a, a two-thirds segment before you go to a big finish. And you want to go ahead and say, what are the hardest questions and what are my best arguments about those hardest questions? So anticipate the rebuttal and give them those arguments. In a criminal law context, in fact, you might go ahead and say, if you're the defense lawyer, that the prosecution's going to have the last, the last word. And please, if you would, as you think about this case, please ask yourself whether or not, in fact, the defense counsel would have something else to say and what questions would the defense still have and ask those questions because I don't get a chance to respond. And some ability to then anticipate the rebuttal, the unknown rebuttal that still may be out there, and to 
ask a question, an important question that you believe that the other side cannot rebut in their final statement. Something that's very difficult, something that in fact is hard for them to spend some time on, can be a way to bait them into spending time on an impossible issue or a very hard issue and take their time away from the other rebuttal in issues that they may have. Now remember that when you're thinking about your own structure, that the law does prohibit some sandbagging from taking place. And let me just describe that in the personal injury context, for example, you cannot wait till rebuttal to talk about your issues of damages. You have a burden of proof, an affirmative burden of proof that you must lay out the issues of damages in your closing argument initially and can't wait and talk about closing argument damages issues if you haven't done that up front. So be careful that you are not in a position of holding back a key argument and then going to be prohibited by the law from raising it because it's not rebuttal, it's really part of your affirmative burden of proof. As you go through your structure, please realize that the exhibits need to be integrated into either your IFRAC or your CRAC, your analysis part of your CRAC or the analysis part of your IFRAC while you're stacking your facts. And it's a good way to remind the jury that the exhibits do show and prove what you want them to show. Now, save something for your big finish. Save something that will allow you to go ahead and end on a high note. And very often what it is, it's a return to what is returned to in jazz, which is your theme, so that the jazz will come back around to the basic theme that has woven itself through the case and repeat that theme and ask whether or not, in fact, it's not fair that, in fact, the jury return a verdict in the light of that theme on your side of the case. Thank you.